kind of all starts out uh, in 1963 when I was 13 years old. I went, had the opportunity to go to a desert and go hunting with my cousins. Well, anyways, on our way back, there was a couple guys in the Jeep and uh, they stopped and they started talking to Uncle Tommy. And uh, anyways, and so my Uncle Tommy had invited them in for uh, uh, a dinner of chucker, quail, and rabbits. So we're sitting around the campfire as kids just listen to the adults talk. And Uncle Tommy was doing a lot of talking at first. It was just basic talking, getting friendly and everything else. And... Uh, Pretty soon, these guys started telling uh, their story, and their story was pretty amazing, it was pretty fantastic. But it was one story that led into another story. When I heard it, it was exciting. It was wonderful. It was borderline fantasy. Uh, I wasn't too sure I believed it, but for some reason. I retained the entire memory of it. And so, so you was 13? 13. 13 at this time? Yeah. So uh, the, the basis of the story was, was they were both prospectors. Uh, Charlie was the old guy. Clint was the younger guy. Anyways, somehow they hooked up together and they worked as mining clay. Gold. Gold mining clay. Uh, plaster. It wasn't a mine, it was plaster. Uh, anyways, they started finding some pretty strange objects on the, on, on the claim. And they didn't know what they were. They had no idea, but they were kind of uh, interested in it. And they were also dumbfounded. Anyways, they knew a lot of the local mining people in that community at the time. And uh, they went to help another miner, and uh, he, uh, his mine was just north of Walker Pass, off of Walker Pass, in the Southern Sierras. And uh, this miner also had found some strange stuff. Same type of stuff? Uh, pretty different? close to the same type of stuff. And uh, what Charlie and Clint were finding were round discs that looked like records. Really? Like, you know, like records, record players, like, yeah. you know, like, uh, you know, the, uh, they were bigger yeah. than the 45 RPM. Were you know, like, they made out of stone or they were made out crystals of stone. or? No, nope, they were made out of stone. Okay. And uh, they were probably about the size of the old uh, 78 RPM records, you know, uh, from the 20s and 30s, somewhere around there. Anyways, and so they were finding those and some other strange stuff. And so they were uh, enthused about it. They were uh, looking for explanations from different people about it. And sure enough, these friends that they knew and helped uh, in, in their mining adventures, you know, they'd been finding stuff. How far apart were these two mines? Hundreds of mi hundred miles? Oh, no. Oh, 10 no. miles? Mm, 10 to 15 miles away. And they're finding the exact same type of stuff. This is just laying on the ground, or this is while no. they're in the mine. This is in the rocks in their mines, or they find caverns? Or? Both of them were found in Caliche. In Caliche? Yeah. Wow. Okay. The ones at Charlie and Clint's were found in Caliche, and the, the miner that they helped them was found in Kalichi. Oh. Anyway, so, um, but they were in, uh, in uh, traveling to different places, trying to get some explanation about it. And they went to a guy they somehow found out about, uh, found through some source, and it was out barsed away. And they went and saw this guy. This guy was an old historian and pretty much had led a 
pretty fantastic life. And uh, he had quite a history behind him. He was old time cowboy, sheriff, marshal, some kind of country cop. And he had pictures and books, all kinds of antiques, and and also a lot of this weird stuff that's been found all over the desert. Anyways, and so they took these discs to him to see if they, he knew anything about him. And he not only knew about him, but he knew the location where they were found without Charlie and Clint divulging where the yeah. location was. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Anyways, and so, but so he fed them some knowledge about it. Anyways, and so they came on back. And that's what they were doing in between their mining. They were going around seeing certain people, and they 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 knew some of the Indians in the area, and they talked to some of the Indians and that type of thing. They found this old desert rat. This desert rat just lived from uh, uh, abandoned building to abandoned building, and he didn't work. He uh, scrounged. That's all. He was just a scrounger. And uh, this old desert rat, he had a history behind him. He knew about this place where there was a, a lost city. But uh, he knew about the Spaniards being there, too. He went on and he, he, he told Charlie and Clint uh, some stories about this place and everything else. And then after that, he shut up and will not talk anymore. And so they kept trying to, to conjole him to open up and give him more information. Anyways, he wasn't going to talk unless he could cut a deal with him. <laughs> and so he didn't, you know, try to include that they didn't know what kind of deal he, they could cut with him. You know, well, he, he wanted some wine. He wanted some cigarettes. He wanted some food. You know, anyways, he made a list of it of what he wanted. And so he gave it to Charlie, and Charlie read it, and Charlie turned around to Clint, and he says, here's the list, go get it, I'm staying with it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, and Charlie went, and so Charlie went shopping while Clint stayed with the old guy. Anyways, a couple of hours later, Clint comes back and he has everything that the old guy asked for. That's when the old guy opened up and told them where to go. And I already told them where to go, but drew a rough map of the area. And from what was on the map and what he said about this area, apparently the old guy had been there. So he knew a lot about it. And so that was it. And they left the old guy. They did not go there immediately. And work to do, assessment work or something, I can't remember. But it was, it took them about a week or so to get all, all prepped and everything. But anyways, where they were going was Black Mountain, which is um, the northern end of the El Paso Peak country. What they call the El Paso Peaks. And, uh, which is um, a good 10 miles south of Inyoka. And uh, in the same neighborhood of, uh, I think it's called Indian Wells Valley. Anyways, and so they found this old road that he talked about. And, uh, uh, and, and he also had on the map some old camps with a bunch of old cars uh, where these old camps were. And uh, just miscellaneous, but how, he says, you recognize this road by this and such and this and, you know, these are the monuments out there, different camps people have made over the years. Anyway, so they found the road and they had a Jeep and, uh, anyways, and they went up the backside of Black Mountain and they got so far in the Jeep where they had to park the Jeep and get out and they couldn't go any further. And then they started climbing the mountain. It's more explicit in my book, for sure. 
Anyway, so they were on the mountain, and uh, uh, they had uh, supernatural experiences up there. This one time they were up there, and they were, and and they were outfitted to with film, movies. They had a movie camera, and uh, they found stuff. And they taken movies of it, and uh, then they go back. And uh, they get back to to the claim and where their trailers were and everything else. And stuff ended up missing. <laughs> they couldn't find. And they knew, knew damn well that they put it in their packs and everything else. Huh. And uh, everything was kind of, some something was weird here. You know? Anyways, uh, the last time they went back, the guy enshrouded in a heavy, thick fog. They could look across uh, over the uh, top of the fog, and they could actually—they were like freaking out or something. They thought it, it was an ocean out there, and uh, it looked like the ocean. Hmm. And uh, so they were kind of under a spell. Well, in this fog, they could make out beams, barely in the shadows, darting back and forth around them. They had all different kinds of supernatural things going on, and uh, they elected to get the hell out of there. And so they left. It, it scared them. It scared the hell out of them. Huh. And so they left. And they finally made their way down to the jeep and took their jeep, drove off the mountain, and never returned. And this is the story they're telling you pretty much in the campfire. In the campfire. Okay. Anyways, and that's that. I haven't told this story for a long time, <laughs> and I've forgotten a lot of it. Yeah. But in my book, I recount the whole thing. Yeah. Exactly how, how it happened. Anyways, so I thought that was a really interesting story. Uh, anyways, uh, so, but it was just a neat story. That's all it was. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have any big beliefs in it that it was real or anything. Yeah. Okay, so that was 1963. Okay, well, fast forward. The end of 71... Maybe the first part of 72. Uh, it's right after I got out of service. I went to work for Pedersen Tire Company. And uh, my oldest brother, Marsh, he was the manager at the uh, Redondo Beach store. And it was a good dealership. And uh, so I went to work for him, Busting Tires. And uh, it was about a couple months down the road, and he had a buddy that uh, worked down the street that was a manager of the tire uh, department for Butler Buick, and he was looking for a guy. And anyways, my brother said, you can make more money working for Bud than you can for me. So, well, he's a buy I'll go down and see him. Okay. So I went down there and met Bud. Sure enough, he hired me. So I went to work for Butler Buick. Uh, but uh, the best part about Butler Buick is when I met Bones and Gene. And Bones worked two bays down from me. Uh, and uh, he was in the tune-up department. And he was a tune-up man. And he was an old grizzled type of guy. Mm -hmm. And he had a gruffy voice. Everything like that, you know. That's the way he talked. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> He's kind of a little guy, but he was a tough guy because he taught karate and jujitsu <laughs> for the police department. Really? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, all kinds of other stuff. He was a tough guy, huh? And, but a neat guy, you know. Anyways, and then. Come to find out, he was a miner, part-time miner. 
and his partner was Gene, and Gene worked over in the uh, heavy uh, front end department, which was uh, out of our shop. There was three big shops there, op open shops, and Gene worked in this other shop, and uh, that was his mining partner. And so, almost every day at lunch, they had a lunchroom upstairs at the end of this shop. And so, uh, I started spending all my lunches with Bones and Jean. And uh, so they, uh, because I, I was interested in the mining thing. Anyways, and uh, the outdoors and everything else. Anyways, I'm finding out that they were... Uh, Mining tungsten out there in the Mojave Desert. Well, what part of Mojave Desert? Well, it was the south end of the El Paso Peak country. <laughs> and uh, anyways, and they, they were mining tungsten, but they were getting byproducts of gold and silver. And they were finding oddities and things like that. They found petrified chipmunks and all different kinds really? of stuff. Oh, yeah. All kinds of stuff in their mind. Really? Yeah. You know, that were petrified and this and that. Huh. Or, you know, turned in rock. And, uh, anyways, and so, hey, this sounded like a great, you know, thing. Anyway, so I kept listening to all of this, you know. Well, guess what? And they started telling this wild story of one day. <laughs> about twin stone chairs that sat facing each other and there was a stone table. Anyways, I'd heard this story before from Charlie and Clint. <laughs> they, told, they told this story at the campfire about that. Huh? Yeah! And that uh, drew me in. <laughs> I wanted to know more about this now. And uh, so they said, well, it's kind of a secret. They said, we just don't take anybody there. You know, this is a secret place. You know, well, these are old guys. You have to understand, these guys are 55, 60 years old. Okay, when they say it's a secret place, they're dead serious. Yeah. Dead serious. You know, so, okay, well, crap, you know, I didn't mean to intrude, but, you know, but I'd still like to go, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so one thing led to another, and they had to make sure that I was going to keep the secret. And, of course, I promised them, not only then, but when I got on up to their bar, I promised them again. And uh, anyway, so they gave me directions to the mine and when to come out. And uh, we did work Saturdays or Sundays. And those guys were always gone, almost every weekend or any time they had a vacation. They were gone and they went mining in their mine. And uh, so they were always gone. Well, uh, what about... When they were working, uh, weren't they, uh, they, and they, they talk about all this equipment and everything else they had there, you know, were they just leave it all there? Do they haul it back? What, what did they have? No, they've got a mine caretaker, old Jim. Really? Yeah. Anyways, and he lives out there. And uh, so anyways, and they told me, they gave me directions how to get there in the whole nine yards. And uh, kind of gave me a rough idea who old Jim was and everything. He's, uh, they, he lives in this trailer that they gave him. And you'll find him there. And uh, if he's gone, he'll put a note on the door. And uh, you are not to leave. And you are not to leave your vehicle. You know, you don't walk around or anything like that, okay? He carries a gun. He's the caretaker. But he might be gone for supplies or to see his buddy, Tiger, or he might take off and go prospecting. But most likely, take off and go buy some wine. 
<laughs> anyways, so, but anyways, they said he'll be there. He's always there every Saturday. Anyways, so, okay, so anyways, I got busy on that Saturday morning. And I got up there, and I thought I was early. Okay, I thought, oh, shit, you know, I'll be, you know, I'm here before Bones and Gene will ever get here. You know, it was about 9 o'clock, then. You know, I was making good time. Yeah. You know, anyways, I could pull them in. They were already there, and they were down in the mine. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, but I didn't find that out until I pulled on up to old Jim's trailer. And, uh, anyways, so I pulled on up to old Jim's trailer, and uh, nobody... Nobody was around. Nobody came out of the trailer. I kind of sat there in the car, car for a little while, and, and there was this great big dog, about that big, maybe that big. Uh -huh. Nice cherry. Uh -huh. It was a big dog, uh -huh. and it looked ferocious. And uh, anyway, so I'm thinking to myself, "Am I going to get out of this car? Am I going to get out of this car? And get eight? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I built up enough nerve, and I got out of the car, and the dog come running at me, and as soon as he, he came to me, I realized this dog was, he doesn't love people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we were instant friends. <laughs> and so I was petting him and everything else, and old Jim come out of his trailer, and uh you got to love desert rats, you know, <laughs> because they're real, real tough people. Yeah. Real hardy. You oh, know? yeah. Anyways, and he comes, at, he comes out of the trailer. He's got a T-shirt on. He's got a T-shirt on. He's got a T-shirt on. He's got a regular shirt, long sleeve shirt on. Okay. He's got some kind of... A uh, little jacket on. He's got another jacket on, and he's in his boxer shorts <laughs> with his boots on, <laughs> and his hair's all gruffed up. He's got about a week's worth of growth, and he comes out yelling and screaming. <laughs> and, but he damn well bones and jeans told him I was coming. Yeah. Anyways, he was trying to scare the hell out of me. And he did. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> <I know. coughs> But uh, anyways, so he called, he called me Darby. Ah, oh, you're Darby. <laughs> anyways, but uh, anyways, so yeah, they're down in the damn mine. They're mining, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyways, he, he, he just hang out with me, you know. He had these old chairs he got from know, the dump or something, yeah. you know. He had chickens, you know. Bones and Gene set him up with everything. Huh? He had chickens, you know. Eggs, you know. Had his own little chicken yard, you know, that was coyote proof and everything else, you know. Had his dog. Uh, had, had his trailer. Uh, he, had, he was set. And, and Bones and Gene would buy him groceries, you know. All the wine he could drink, <laughs> you know. Anyway, so I learned a lot off old Jim in the few years I knew of him. He was a he was a real desert rat, uh, a real uh, outdoorsman, uh, good prospector, re real good prospector. Uh, old Jim was uh, in World War II. He was in the Navy. Hmm. And got out at the end of World War II. And got married. Had two little girls. He became an insurance salesman. And uh, Korea broke out. And he went back into the Navy. <laughs> and Korea ended. He came out of the Navy and started with insurance again. And, uh, anyways, uh, life was pretty good for him, he said, on up until the girls were growing up. And uh, the, between the girls and his wife, he was pretty much henpecked. 
<laughs> and uh, he was uh, having a rough time with it. And finally, one day, he said, enough is enough. And he loaded up his car uh, with what he had at the house. And I think they lived in Long Beach or some, somewhere down there. And he didn't have a lot, but he, whatever he had, he loaded up his car. He told his wife he was going out on route or whatever, and he left. And he got up into the town of Mojave, and he filled up his car with gas, and he did some major shopping, uh, food shopping. He bought a sleeping bag, a tent, a stove, <laughs> some you know, camping utensils, stuff like that. He didn't know where he was going. He was going somewhere. Hmm. But he did not know where. He was just getting away. Huh? <laughs> and he drove on out. And uh, anyways, and he, he hit... Uh, I think he hit Gold Canyon, but it, it might have been the Mesquite Canyon or maybe, maybe Last Chance Canyon. I can't remember. But anyways, his car broke down. Got stuck in the sand or something. I can't remember. And uh, anyways, he says camped out right there. Wherever his car. If his car broke down. I can't get out. Okay, this, this is camp. I set up the tent. Anyways. And then after that, he just started wandering the hills. And um, over a period of time, he ran out of food and water and everything else. And now he's in the desert all alone and uh, under the, uh, the elements. He laid down to go to sleep and die. And, uh, but that wasn't his fate. Because Bones and Jean showed up hmm. walking the desert with black lights. <laughs> <laughs> and they found him. Huh. And nursed him back to health. And was shortly after that, they, they, they found what they were looking for, his tungsten load. And uh, they made him a partner. And he was the caretaker. Huh. It was a pretty interesting story. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. Anyways, and, uh, anyways, so, so anyways, getting back to it, uh, uh so, uh, Bones and Jean came out of the mine shortly, and I met them, the whole nine yards, and, well, they had to show me the mine, you know, but you're not afraid of holes, because if you are, it's tough shit, you know, <laughs> Here's the mining hat. You got my mining hat on. We got a little elevator here, a you know, tram train, and then we got an elevator at the bottom. Anyways, they gave me the whole classic tour of the mine. It was really cool. And uh, I was there when they were setting the dynamite and the whole deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, they did not. They used the old-fashioned way of doing that the dynamiting. And then we got out of there in time. Uh, you know, they had know, three or four minute fuses or something like that. We got out of there. And, uh, no sooner we got out of there, the, the blast went off. And they said, well, that's it. We can't go to work until tomorrow. You know, we got to let it clean yeah. up. You know. So uh, he showed me around, gave me a grand tour of the claim, this and that. And uh, basically, that was it for the day, you know. So, no, we're, we're not going to go see the stone church. Oh, no, we'll go tomorrow. <laughs> Anyways, oh, okay. That's cool, you know. I, Had you I, told them the story when that you heard when you was a kid from the other guys? No. Okay. So, they didn't know you knew. All I told them was, was uh, that I... I, I did tell him that I knew the story. Okay. But I didn't go into yeah, yeah, the no. depth of it. And uh, 
Yeah, did, did these guys happen to find any of these stone discs or anything like that in their mind? No. Okay. No. They never found anything like that. Okay. All they knew that. They found these stone chairs with yep. a table. Yep. An altar or something. Yeah. And guess who took them there? Who? Old Jim. Huh. Yeah. Old Jim and Tiger used to go on Black Mountain. Ah. And uh, the way old Jim tells it is, is they were way too far north. They were looking for this little canyon, okay, of where another friend of theirs who had just recently passed away, okay, had given them detailed instructions on how to find this little canyon. Okay, and there was really some, uh, some very good prospects there and, and where he'd found some pretty nice nuggets. And so, so old Jim and Tiger, they were interested in that. And so they, they were looking for this little canyon. And according to old Jim, they just walked way too far north. And so they said, okay, this is not here. We, you know, we don't know where it is. Let's turn around and go back, you know. And it was on their return trip. They ran into the stone chairs. Mm -hmm. And anyways, and through some conversation and everything else, they told Gene and Bones about it. And Bones was really interested in it. And uh, they were both very down-to-earth people. The Bones was really interested in it. Hmm. And so they they went up and they said they but it took Bones and Gene two or three tries until they found it. And uh, so anyways, and they had a uh, a uh, bunk shack, okay, with a um, old fashioned pot belly stove, you know. And uh, anyways, and so. Spent the night there uh, with the guys, and they had bunks, and they had enough because Bones had a boys that would come up uh -huh. sometimes and help them. And I don't think Gene had boys, but uh, 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 Bones did. He had boys, and then he, his boys had friends, and they'd come on up. And uh, anyway, so there was six or eight bunks in the bunkhouse. But the bunkhouse was old, and uh, because there was a ghost in the bunkhouse, okay. But the ghost usually liked to hang out on the porch. <laughs> That's the way, you know. He says, uh, you know, he won't bother you because he liked to hang out on the porch. <laughs> and, but sure enough, you'd be sleeping in there, you know, and you would hear some odd stuff going really? on, you know, and. Uh, you know, I, I was probably maybe uh, 12 or 15 times there, you know, spent the night there and everything else. So the second or third night, ah, shit, this, this is a piece of cake, you know. But the first night, oh, that, yeah, that kept me awake. Really? <laughs> yeah. So how old are you at this time, approximately? Uh, I was 22 or 23, okay. something like that. All right, and so the following morning, we took a jeep ride, and uh, there's a road that takes off to the left. It's a, a Gene said it was an old wagon road originally, uh, turned into a jeep road. And so we took that, and that kind of winds up and winds up and winds up slowly, slowly, slowly. And then it, it crosses this real steep ravine and then climbs up a little higher and, and then finally get up to a place where you have to stop. There's a turnaround and that's it. And you can't go anymore. <coughs> and then we got the Jeep. I didn't know it at the time because I, I don't know where the hell they're taking me. You know. Well, it's north of of the peak, mm. of the Northwest Peak. Anyways, and uh, since you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Anyways, and uh, you remember where where we went and found the, uh, the carvings of the twin gods? Yep. 
Okay, and well, that, that right there is where the uh, the uh, Terrace Valley is. Okay, well, uh, if you keep on going to the north, higher on up, that's where the the uh, twin stone chairs are oh. that face each other. Okay. Okay. Anyways, so but we. We didn't come down this way. We kept to the ridge, okay? Gene, that's where I learned about ridges, was from Gene. He says, stay to the ridge. He says, we'll tell you when to go down. <laughs> Anyways, and so we stayed to the ridge and then uh, found where they had their trail. And then we came on down and we're coming on down and and Gene says, there it is, right there. And I looked, and Grandma, I don't see anything. <laughs> I am back then to see something fantastic. Yeah. I don't see anything. And uh, anyways, we get on up to it. And uh, anyways, Gene says, there it is. What do you think of it? <laughs> I said, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. I mean, you know, I am my big fools or what? Anyways, and so they had the whole thing covered with brush. Oh, <laughs> you couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. Yeah. Oh. So they started pulling the brush out and everything else, and there it was carved out of olivine basalt, twin, great big twin stone chairs facing each other. And in between was this great big table, and everything was covered with petroglyphs. On top of the table? On, on top the of the table, the... on the back of the chairs, nothing on the seats of the chairs. But the chairs all one piece, okay? Not two piece chairs, one piece chairs. So, so are these big as in they fit me and you perfectly, oh, yeah. or are they bigger than that? Well, they're a little bit bigger than that. They're big. They're made for big people. Giants? Well, depends who, what you, you call, call a giant. giant huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, you know, is Wilt Chamberlain a giant? Yeah, I guess he is. <laughs> <laughs> to me, he is. Okay. Yeah, okay. Anyways, yeah, so big chairs. Okay. Okay. Uh, Anyways, and so I stood there as they uncovered it. I realized this is all true. And who the hell made this stuff? Wow. You know, and so I'm, now I'm I'm having big questions in my mind. Yeah. Anyways, and so they uncovered, and it was in a circular, a big circular, bigger than, probably bigger than this room, you know. Depression and uh, Bones and Gene uh, were sitting at the edge of the depression as I walked on down, starting to inspect all of this. And they decided to have a smoke break while I went to investigate. And uh, so they were sitting on the edge having a smoke and then they were talking amongst each other. And uh, I went on over there and something, you know, I thought, decided to sit in one. <laughs> and that was my biggest mistake. So I sat in one of these stone chairs uh -huh. and all of a sudden, According to Bones and Gene, I disappeared. Could you, and you could still see them? I, I couldn't see them either. I was in a fog. It was like a fog rolled in? Or? Uh, no, a fog didn't roll in. All the time, in the fog. Was a fog huh? Yeah. It was like, okay, I mean, like, I don't take ducks. I've never taken ducks. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> All my close friends, okay, ducks. Me? No, never. <laughs> I, you know, I've been high 
ever since I was bored, I don't need drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but I sat in that stone chair. I went into another world. And it was just like a great big fog. And right in front of me was this big guy. And it was some kind of, best I can uh, explain it to you, he was in like a full dress and he was holding up his hands like he was holding something, but I couldn't see what he was holding. It was just, it was like this, but it was, maybe it was a basketball, <laughs> but it was clear. It was he invisible. Couldn't see it, but he was, I couldn't he, see it. He was holding something. He, he was holding it. something up and he was talking to me. And he was trying to tell me something. Could you hear him? or? Yeah, I could hear him. But you didn't understand what I he was saying? I couldn't understand what he was saying. Or? Yeah, a totally different language. Okay. Totally foreign. Okay. But he was standing there and he was telling me. He said a big person. Like what? Shane Brillen big? Oh, oh, like eight or nine feet tall. Oh, okay. okay. Anyways, but he was dark complected, he had long hair. He had uh, feathers through his hair, not not like Indian feathers or anything, something different. Okay. He had uh, a robe on, colorful robe, red, white, or red, uh, blue, uh, hmm. you know, super colorful, rainbow type thing, yeah. you know. Uh, <coughs> the, the funny thing is, is he had some kind of boots on. You know, I, I, I couldn't make it out. Boots or sandals? Uh, uh, I no sandals. sandals no, some type I, of a boot. Some type of boot. Anyways, and this all happened in a second or two. Uh -huh. Remember, it seemed it's the seemed like forever. But bums and jeans, I don't, don't this all happens just real quick. Okay. Anyways, while I was in this trance, bums and jeans were running around looking for me. What the hell happened to him? You Where could he go? Were you aware of they looking for you or not? No, no. Okay, you was oblivious to that. I was totally oblivious to the, the other thing. Yeah. Anyways. And so, something happened to me. I'm listening to this whole thing. I'm seeing this vision and everything else. And I get out of the chair. And all of a sudden, bing, pff, I'm, I'm back to reality. And Bones and Gene found me. And Bones, uh, Gene says... Where the hell have you been? I said, hey, I've been here the whole time. <laughs> I haven't moved. He's, uh, but I could ask you the same question. <laughs> Anyways. Did you tell them what you've seen? Yeah. Did you say what they say? Yeah, yeah. That, they didn't say anything. Had they, they, they listened to me intently. Had, had they sat in the chair and no, got the they same never, experience? They never, they never sat in the chair. Okay. Where they were sitting before, as I was walking on them, they were sitting and having a smoke. We ended up sitting in the same place. Uh, of course, I started smoking. Nervously, I might have smoked four or five. Yeah. <laughs> almost immediately. It's just like, like, yeah. like a man. I mean, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was yeah, a be, wild experience. That would be a wild experience. Yeah, and... Uh, I mean, it was so wild that, uh, you know, you question yourself over all of this stuff. I mean, am I losing my mind? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, well, what's happening here, you yeah. know? And uh, does this, uh, this all really happen? You know, why is everything so, I mean, I, I can remember it, you know? It's hard to get out of your head. Yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, you're saying to yourself, wow. You know, that was, so that's, that was what that experience was like. Uh, we went on back to the mine. Uh, we didn't talk very much after that. Uh, when I sat down and I started smoking, I, I, I relayed everything to Bones and Gene. And they didn't sit there and tell me that I was full of it. They just listened. They listened intently. They didn't ask a lot of questions. They just listened intently. And 
there was, we kind of sat there in silence for, I don't know, five or ten minutes, looking at the stone chair, and uh, Bone says, well, I guess we better cover it up now. And so they grabbed the brush, covered it all up, stood back, looked at it, went back, kind of rearranged the bushes, make sure nothing's going to blow away, that type of thing. Stood back, look at it, go back, you know. Like they were taking care of this thing, mm -hmm. you know, and they were, you know. And, uh, Anyways, after about maybe 30 minutes or so, they were all done. And Bones come walking on, or Gene come walking on up, turns around, looks at him, goes, I think that's good, let's go. <laughs> so we went back up and all the way to the Jeep and drove on down and didn't really talk a lot, you know. And, Got on down to the mine. By that time, it was in the late afternoon on Sunday. And uh, I said, gosh, I, I, I better go home. I think it's time to go home. And Bone said, yeah, I think it's time for you to go home, too. <laughs> there was, I said, okay. So I left, went home. And so I thought about that the whole week. Yeah, I bet you did. Yeah. And more, more than that, more than, but I mean, and uh, anyways, and so, but I kept on spending my lunch with him and everything else, but, but, uh, so, uh, uh, that Friday, um, I asked Gene, I said, uh, do you mind if I come up this weekend? He says, I don't mind. Uh, go, go ask Bones. And so I uh, went on over to Bones. I said, Bones, uh, I already asked Gene, and he says he doesn't mind. Uh, do you mind if I come up this week? He goes, No, it sounds great. Come on up. We'll see you in the morning. He says, You come early, you get breakfast. <laughs> so I started going to the mine. <laughs> so I went to the mine a lot. And uh, but I had this thing in me now. I wanted to know. What happened to you? What happened to me? Anyways, and so when I realized that I was going to, I wanted more info about this, I realized my car couldn't make it where their Jeep was. Okay. That I had to attack the mountain from another side. Okay. Anyways. And so, uh, uh, I, I can't remember which time it was, but anyways, I promised Bones and Gene that I wasn't going to say anything, I was going to talk about it, this experience or anything. But even if it took the rest of my life, I was going to find out what this place was. And then I gave him my promise. Mm -hmm. That was my first promise. Three promises. I made three promises over this thing. I kept all three. Awesome. Anyways, and that last promise, that was a very personal promise. And uh, if I had not kept my promise, I could have been a rich man. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy I kept that promise.